um, in a very um, interesting place as a church. We've done a lot. There's been a lot of work that's been done in terms of planting and transitioning into being established and um, new leadership structures, new initiatives, a bunch of different things coming out of a pandemic. Bless the Lord. And when, listen, it's okay for us to be, we know that COVID still exists, but the way in which we relate to it is different, right? And so it, we relate to it in such a way now that we experience quite a bit more freedom than we did two years ago this time. So that's what I mean by come out of. But we've come through that together. And there's a place where the Lord, I believe, is taking us spiritually as a church family. And many of us are experiencing some waves. Yes. Many of us. <laughs> So I want to, there's two stories, um, and not stories as in fictional, they're just tellings of things that happen. Jesus and his disciples were healing and teaching in a place called Galilee, and um, after they've done this work, this is in Mark, Jesus says, no, let's get in the boat, you know, cross the sea, and we're going to go over there. It starts at 35 in verse, uh, chapter 4. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. Um, it says lake in this translation, but that's the Sea of Galilee. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. I honestly missed that part before that other boats follow. These stalkers are like coming after Jesus and his disciples, <laughs> like, like paparazzi, like <laughs> that's like. But as soon, but soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat and it began to fill with water. I'm going to pause there for a second because I want you to uh, do me a favor, London. Go back to that first verse. If you have a paper Bible and you have a way to do this, or if you have an electronic Bible and you have a way to do this, just underline, let's cross to the other side of the lake. There's something that's valuable about Jesus saying, let's cross to the other side of the lake that I think is important that we hold on to even in these next verses. So I'll start again at 37. But, as, but soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? No. <laughs> Listen, like, I, that's, I want to make sure I, I say that with a little bit like, you know, half tongue in cheek. But the answer is no. I told you to highlight or underline, let's cross to the other side of the lake on purpose. No, you don't care that we're going to drown because we ain't going to drown. <laughs> I said, let's cross to the other side of the lake. <laughs> there is a confidence in Jesus here that if how many of us are familiar with this passage of scripture just a real quick wave offering you know you probably heard 13 sermons about this this isn't new to us so I'm not going to bore us with the idea that Jesus was confident sitting in the back of the boat but for those of us who are new to this Jesus was asleep in the back of the boat <laughs> while everybody else is in a panic Jesus is literally asleep in the back of the boat and they wake him up, Master, don't you, aren't you realize we're about to die? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, silence, be still. Some of your versions have peace, be still. I like that one better. Suddenly, the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. <laughs> Who is this man? They asked each other, even the wind and waves obey him. Normally, we hear this sermon and we're preaching about Jesus speaking peace and that we should have peace because Jesus has peace. But I actually want to focus on the disciples. This is kind of a reverse sermon. A lot of times we focus on the resolution, God calm the storm, and he will calm the storm in your life. And I actually don't want to focus on that. 
I want to focus on all of these men and women afraid when Jesus already spoke that we're going to cross to the other side and they're terrified of the waves and the water coming in. That's us in many ways. And while it's nice to say, Jesus, calm the storm, I think it's okay for us to know and even say out loud that that was a mercy act, not something that Jesus always wants to do. That was mercy, not something Jesus always wants to do. That's why he asks them, you still don't have enough faith for this? I said, let's cross to the other side. If I'm asleep, you, you just witness all these people being healed. <laughs> but let me calm the storms because you're not, you're not ready for that yet. That's a mercy thing. That's a mercy thing. Just so that we are also working with the same definition of mercy, because sometimes we lump grace and mercy together because they're both wonderful, but they are different. There's a separation between the two. They flow out of the same place, the love of God for his creation, but they are different in their application. Grace is you could not have done anything to deserve what I'm about to give you, and here you go. You couldn't earn it. You're not good enough for it. There wasn't anything that you did. And quite honestly, there's nothing that you're going to do to mess it up either because it's not based on you. It's based on me. That's grace. Here you go, daughter, son, there. Mercy, however, is you deserve punishment. You deserve pain. You deserve discomfort. You deserve tears. You deserve gnashing of teeth in the King James Version. But what I'm going to give you is opposite of what you deserve. What they deserved because they had just seen Jesus do a bunch of miracles five minutes before. What they deserved is to sit in there, in all of the discomfort of what it was to be on a ship in the Sea of Galilee, Jesus chilling in the back, they deserved to just navigate the discomfort of that. But in mercy, Jesus calms the storm. Here's what I mean by I deserve. They didn't earn the storm, but they earned the ability in that moment to not be distracted by the storm because they had just seen God do a whole bunch of things through Jesus, right? You can't unsee Jesus bring somebody back from the dead. You can't unsee Jesus heal somebody's blindness. You can like, it's like all of a sudden I forgot, like it wasn't even an hour ago. What they deserved in that moment was to sit in the discomfort and cross over to the other side because Jesus said, let's cross over to the other side. But in mercy, he was like, okay, they're clearly not ready. (laughs) And that's why he corrects them because mercy doesn't come without correction. Okay? Okay. Mercy doesn't, and correction isn't punishment. It's just, listen, you deserve this. We got to talk about it. You deserve this, but I'm going to give you this, but let's not keep doing that. (laughs) Right? You deserve to continue in this discomfort because you know who I am and what I just said five minutes ago. But because you're out here in a panic, let me settle it down. But let's not continue in that pattern. Another thing plays out very similarly, and it's actually on the same sea. You would think that like the settings and the the surroundings would have them be more confident. No, it's, it's not. They're literally doing ministry in Galilee again. This is, and we're we're gonna jump over to Matthew chapter 14. 
But Jesus, this is that moment where Jesus does the lunch banquet with two fish and five loaves. I say lunch banquet on purpose. Okay, they got leftovers. I don't even know how you come up with leftovers. Did, so here's the thing. This is, I'm going to let y'all just wrestle with this for a minute. Did Jesus, because did he multiply, multiply the food or did he just significantly diminish their appetites? <laughs> I'm going to let y'all figure that out. <laughs> I know. I just, <laughs> they had 12 baskets of leftover, so I'm pretty sure he multiplied it. But it's still, either one would have been a miracle, okay? Because I'm sure there was some teenage boys in there. And, <laughs> and if you can diminish a teenage boy's appetite, you certainly are creator of the universe. <laughs> okay? Reach in there and change that metabolism, Jesus. Do it for us, Lord. <laughs> ministry in Galilee is heavy, it's good. Feeding all of these thousands of people, 5,000 plus humans, and each of the disciples get a basket, a to go basket. That's what it really, that's what that means, right? There are 12 baskets left over, they all get to get a to go basket. Immediately after this, it says in 22, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> While he sent the people home, this time no paparazzi though, after sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from the land for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. I need us to just pause. We've, we've heard this story before. This is, many of us, this is not unfamiliar to us. This isn't new information, not new data. But I need us to put ourselves there for a second. Jesus is teaching, he's healing, he's multiplying fish and bread, telling them, go to the other side of the lake. This happens chronologically after that first one. So they've already seen this stuff before. It's the Sea of Galilee. They are, many of these people are fishermen, so they know Sea of Galilee always ends up with some storms. This is not new information. And at three o'clock in the morning, now I'm going to give it to them. They're exhausted. They're tired. And when we're tired, we tend, to, we tend to lose ourselves a little bit. Jesus comes walking on the water. It's important that we put ourselves there because we're the disciples in these stories. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. Listen, they weren't terrified about the storm, interestingly enough here. They were terrified because they saw Jesus walking on water. <laughs> In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost, <laughs> which some of y'all didn't even catch before. I'll leave that there. We won't talk about it. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage. I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. That will be a highlight, underlying moment. Yes, come. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus, which in and of itself whew, was a whole moment. I realize now as I'm reading this, okay, uh, I used to live in Georgia, and there was a moment where we were at the beach, um, uh, the Atlantic Ocean, and I was off by myself, and I was determined to walk on the on Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> I was a little kid, okay? So that's what it was. I was a little kid, but le legitimately, I was, it took me like 10 minutes to give up. Like, <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I was trying, but Jesus didn't say come. So, <laughs> so now I know why I did that. <laughs> <laughs> he walked on the water toward Jesus, but when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. 
You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshiped him. You really are the son of God, they exclaimed. I know that oftentimes we would settle into that resolution. But truly, these are all, we're, this is not a story just of miracles. It's a story of mercy. You can't unsee what God does. The challenge that the disciples were in is because they were, it's not that they were facing unsurmountable odds. The reality is they have actually seen that these odds are actually surmountable. (laughs) They are actually overcomable because I didn't imagine that you were going like feed 5,000 plus people with two fish sticks and five pieces of toast, but you did it. And that actually was a bit more miraculous than me walking on water. (laughs) But still, they struggled with belief. I want you to see this picture because I believe that many of us, I have had too many conversations over the last couple of weeks to know that many of us are are in this place. I think that's really why the Holy Spirit wouldn't let me let it go. Even though I want to encourage you women, I really do. So please know I'm praying for you. The reality is our church family needs to know that many of us are in a storm. You are not alone in a storm. You're not alone in it. We're like all the other disciples. Jesus has already told us, let's go to the other side. But we're in this space of, as, even as a church family, some of us are dealing with it in our bodies Some of us are dealing with it in our emotions. Some of us are dealing with it in our minds. Some of us are dealing with it spiritually. And we're in this space where we keep seeing waves and water crashing in, our faces wet. And we're like, Jesus, just stop it. Wake up. You are not alone. I think one of the things I want to make sure I point us to is these disciples were terrified in the moment. They were terrified in the moment. If you're navigating some stuff that feels like a bunch of turmoil and you're afraid of what's going to happen, afraid of what's going to be lost, afraid of what you're not going to see at the end of it, trust me, you join generations of believers navigating the Sea of Galilee. And you're also a part of this church family and kind of we're all right now in this boat doing this. We're all here. We're all here. So for a moment, take some comfort in knowing that you're not the only one on the sea. Because the difference between a traumatic experience and one that's just really hard is someone to go with it through. (laughs) So we're all on this boat together. Let somebody know what waves you're experiencing, and I promise you, you'll get, you'll hear. They're navigating some waves too. But I also want us to not catch the correct, to not miss the correction. That's the part. I know it's so nice to let it be wrapped up in Jesus did the mercy thing. He calmed the storm. He let Peter walk on water, and all of those things are great. But the correction part is, you have already seen that I'm bigger than this. You've already seen that I'm bigger than this. Oh, let that conviction set in for a minute. Because it's not to condemn us. Jesus wasn't condemning them, but he was correcting them. You've already, talk about the waves, point to the rain. But you've already seen that I'm bigger than this. Talk about the discomfort. Experience the pain and be able and confess that that's what's going on. But you've already seen that I'm bigger than this. You've already seen it. There's this song by Fred Hammond that this week I was the the Lord. Let me tell you. When I say, Christine and I are in the boat like this right now. (laughs) 
on this song um, by Fred Hammond. It's on the Spirit of David <clears throat> um, uh, album. <clears throat> and it goes, I can hold you to your word. You're never wavering. You won't turn. For I am sure you are the promise keeper. His name of the song is Promise Keeper. And honestly, I got stuck at I am sure. And for like three hours, I had to sit there and ask myself, am I actually sure? The song is great. <laughs> and it's encouraging. Got a whole playlist right now of promise. It's literally called Faithful Promise Keeping God Playlist. <laughs> Because I need the encouragement. But that lyric, for I am sure, convicted me. Are you sure that God is the promise keeping God? Are you sure that when he says, let's go to the other side, that we're going to make it to the other side? Are you sure that when he says, yeah, come on out here, come to me? that you're going to make it to him. If you haven't actually wrestled with that for a minute, I'm going to be honest with you, you're not being vulnerable with your faith. It's okay for us to stop for a second and ask ourselves, am I sure? And really what ended up happening was I needed to remind myself, my, my soul needed to kick in and remember what I'd seen. I think the thing why I said I want to focus on the disciples is because the disciples did not remind themselves of what they have seen. Our emotions do an amazing thing of appropriately, when our emotions are healthy, right? When our emotions are healthy, they appropriately gauge what's going on in reality to allow us to know how to respond. Right. If a pack of, you know, if a pack of wildebeest start crashing through this building, your emotions should tell you move. <laughs> In an unhealthy scenario, sometimes our emotions tell us to respond in ways that are not fitting for the moment. But when we have these moments where Really, God has said, let's cross over to the other side and waves start breaking in. Our emotions are doing what they're supposed to do, but they're in contradiction to what we're supposed to be responding with. And our soul has to kick in and say, remember when he just fed that 5,000 plus people? Remember when he healed that woman with the issue of blood? Remember when he did this for you? Remember when he did that? Emotions, you are doing what you're supposed to do, but the rest of us, right? The rest of your being, your mind, your body, your soul has to kick in and say, emotions, settle down. We know what this is. It's just a wave. And then guess what? Emotions kick in again because... <laughs> They're, it's not that they're unhealthy. They're doing what they're supposed to do. You're financially struggling. Absolutely, you should feel tight and stressed and frustrated because you have to juggle with what bill you're going to pay. But if the Lord said, let's cross to the other side, or the Lord says, I got you, you're okay. Yeah, you got to juggle right now. I have you, though. That's when our soul kicks in and say, look at the fact that you have something to juggle with while we wait <laughs> for the Lord to bring peace because he said he has us. Don't you remember when you were struggling last year and he brought you through that? Some of us are wrestling in our bodies. Don't you remember when he brought you out of that? And let's be real. There's another part that kicks in too. Well, he didn't bring me out of this one. <laughs> he didn't bring me out of that one over there. And he didn't, bring, he didn't bring such and such out of this. And he didn't bring such and such out of that. Yep. All that does is serve to cause us to do what happened with Peter. We start looking at the waves. 
as opposed to acknowledging that there are waves. Sometimes we got to pause and say, oh, these waves, Jesus. Um, Look, I'm still here, but these waves. (laughs) And pause for a second. Am I sure that you said come out? Am I sure that you said we're going to the other side? And I'll stand confidently because I haven't heard anything different, but I might need to just stand here before I take another step so I can make sure that my faith is where it needs to be because another wave is coming. I think this story is in the Scripture not just because we get to celebrate the miraculous peace-speaking Jesus, but we also get to learn from the moment that Jesus corrected them for not reminding themselves and each other, do you remember when God made a way out of no way in that moment? That's actually us in this boat. Do you remember when God made a way for us as a church family to have a place to be? When we were weeks from not having a place to be? Do you remember when your church closed and you didn't know what it was going to be like on the other side of that? But you trusted that the Lord had a home for you and you have found home? Do you remember what it was like when you went through months of not knowing what was going to happen financially because you had been laid off from your job, but but the Lord used countless things to make sure that your electricity stayed on, that your heat never went out in the winter, that you always had something to feed one another, and 12 baskets left over. Family, this is what we do in storms. Yeah, we pray together. Absolutely, we pray together. And there's nothing wrong with asking God, please wake up, Jesus. (laughs) But if he needs to take a nap for a minute, let us also remind each other that he said, let's go to the other side. It's human to want Jesus to wake up when I'm struggling. That's a part of what it is to know he's a good father is to go to him and he'll comfort us. But in the moments where we need to actually trust that he's doing what he said he's going to do, we have to remind each other as siblings, he's going to do it. And he's already done a bunch. Stay in the boat. It's just a wave. It's just a wave. You felt like it was time to give up, but it was just a wave. You felt, we have this saying in our home, that your feelings are real, but they're not always rooted in truth. Right? That's okay. We get to be mature people and say you feel all of those things. You feel like you're about to drown, Peter. But that's not rooted in truth. The master of creation who made water told you to get out of the boat and come walk to him. It's okay to acknowledge the feeling while being able to also say this feeling isn't rooted in truth. This is just a wave. You felt like it was time to give up. I'm giving you time I'm giving you time right now to point to that thing that you felt like it was time to give up on. And you did. And to acknowledge for a moment that you gave up in a moment where it was actually just a wave. We all have one of those or two or three or ten. I think that's why in Scripture we get two stories of it. So we know that it's okay for us to acknowledge that we don't always do that right. They didn't get it the first time. You, if you've been walking with the Lord for any amount of time, you've experienced a wave that convinced you that God wasn't doing what he said he was doing. And it's okay. Not a, con- not a condemning moment. But let the conviction sit in for a second 
That was just a wave, daughter. That was just a wave, son. I didn't say anything different. And in mercy, I, I kept you. But if you are going to continue to see me do amazing things, you have to point to the fact that that was just a wave or you won't have confidence that you need to actually walk in deep, scary waters. This next little moment, keep pressing toward the other side. Keep pressing toward the other side. And here, let me, let's, let's just be real. All right, motion, listen. Anybody familiar with the Enneagram? I know we're not going to do a sermon on the Enneagram. But for those of you who know what the Enneagram is, I am a three with a four wing. And so, and a, uh, a four wing is we experience all the highs and lows of all of the emotions. I have extreme emotions, okay? <laughs> So when I feel things, I feel them. Some of y'all, but the problem is that I, I don't always know what I'm feeling, so everybody else is in the boat with me. <laughs> oh, pray for Christine. Pray for Christine. She'll be in the boat with me. She don't, even, she don't know what I'm feeling. I don't know what I'm feeling, but it's big. No. <laughs> Listen, pray her strength in the Lord. Okay. <laughs> Many of us have those where we feel and it's okay to stop. Because I think one of the things we lie to each other with is just say, just keep moving, just keep moving, just keep moving. And honestly, that is just, you start denying things at that point and you're not even trusting God anymore. You're just ignoring the world around you. What is true in our faith is to say, God, I'm going to keep walking, but these waves, Jesus. I need you to do something about these waves. Okay, you're not doing anything about the waves? Okay, I'm going to just keep walking. Okay, I got to pause for a second. Gather myself because I'm, about to, I'm forgetting. So let me remind myself of what you did five minutes ago. Okay, walk again. And you'll probably have to do that every morning if you're a four or you got a four wing like me. <laughs> because the waves can be so incredibly distracting. They're so incredibly distracting to the point where we start questioning, did God actually say, let's go to the other side? Or did he just say, get in the boat? <laughs> Let me go back. No, he said, let's go to the other side. Okay. Keep pressing toward the other side. Because if God said, we're going to the other side, then that is what he said. I, this week and many of us, we might have this thing like, how do I know if it's a promise? Because God said it, it's a promise, Amen. period. Amen. What he says happens, period. He said, let there be light. There was, <laughs> period. He doesn't have to say, I promise there's going to be light. That's something we got to do. He doesn't have to. All he has to do is say it, and it is a promise because all things begin to align with what he said. Keep pressing toward the other side. And when, not if, when waves come, reaffirm your faith. Call a sister, call a brother, and let them remind you of what God has done. When we call each other, don't just sit back and be overwhelmed, overwhelm each other with how it's struggling that, oh, like God, it's, it's hard to trust God. It's hard because God, sometimes God doesn't come through the way we want him to. And sometimes, no, stop for a second and remind yourselves. This is what faith looks like in a family.